Well, welcome everyone to the libraries. Um, I'm going to get started on time. I see a few people uh, coming in now, but I want to make sure everyone has um, a handout from the back. Yeah, they're, they're, they're right in the back there. Welcome again. I am Michelle Light, the Director of Special Collections. And first, I want to ask you, how many of you have actually been over to Special Collections to see the first folio? Not everyone has raised their hands yet. I really do hope you get over there. Uh, the Libraries is so honored uh, to host uh, the first folio on its tour around the country to celebrate 400 years of uh, Shakespeare and his legacy. Um, as many of you probably know, um, the first folio includes 36 of Shakespeare's plays, 18 of which had never been published before. And without uh, Shakespeare's fellow actors compiling the first folio seven years after his death, uh, plays like Macbeth, Twelfth Night, Julius Caesar, The Tempest, they all would have been lost to history. So I just want to give you some numbers. 750 first folios were printed. 235 uh, are survived today. 82 of them are at the Folger Shakespeare Library, and they have let one of them come about a few hundred feet away, so I hope you all get a chance to go see um, one of the first folios. Many people have made this tour possible. There are a few folios circulating around the country to all 50 states, Puerto Rico and DC, um, the Folger Shakespeare Library, the American Library Association, the Cincinnati Museum, the National Endowment for the Humanities, Google, and some other sponsors. But there are many, many people to thank uh, who have helped organize this within the libraries and campus facilities because preservation of that folio is very difficult to get at the right temperature and humidity. Um, and we have over 15 events planned, uh, from scholarly lectures to events for families uh, and children, uh, performances, and all the people that have collaborated with us um, and have agreed to do lectures to help us enrich your experience and appreciation for the fo first folio. We are in deeply indebted to all of them for making this possible for the UNLV libraries. So if you don't know about our upcoming lectures, uh, I encourage you to pick, out, pick up a brochure in the back or check out our website. You can register for more um, events and lectures, and uh, you can reserve a time um, to go see the folio. Uh, you can walk in right now, but I'm sure towards the end, um, until September 29th, that last week I'm sure is going to be packed. So get to see it right now. But right now I would like to introduce um, Professor Richard Harp, and again, thank him for speaking today. Uh, Richard Harp is a professor and past chair of UNLV's English department. His academic specialties include English Renaissance literature, Irish literature, and the Bible as literature. He was founding co-editor with Stanley Stewart of UC Riverside of the Ben Johnson Journal, published by Edinburgh University Press, whose editorial offices have been at UNLV since its inception in 1992. Professor Harp has published seven books and created scholarly editions of the plays and masks of William Shakespeare's contemporary, Ben Jonson. So now I would like to hand this over to Professor Harp. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, let me know if uh, you can't hear me in, in the back. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Michelle and Priscilla for organizing this event, for inviting me to come here. I want to thank all of you for uh, taking uh, time, uh, 4 o'clock on Thursday afternoon, uh, for being here. Uh, it is a wonderful occasion. The, our library has done so many great things over the past uh, few years, organizing programs like this. And uh, Patty Iannuzzi, I want to thank her too, the director of the library, uh, who has uh, provided so many of these stimulating programs. So, very appreciative of your, of your efforts. 
Uh, what I want to do is to talk about the prefatory material uh, in the first folio, uh, which is relatively slight, a few poems, um, uh, a prose, uh, a preface, as it were, by the editors of the first folio. I'm going to concentrate on one poem in particular, uh, which is a poem by Ben Jonson uh, about Shakespeare, surely the most famous poem ever written about Shakespeare, and maybe the most famous poem ever written uh, about any author. Um, before I do that, though, I, I, uh, you know, any, any book has two aspects. It, it, it has its material or its physical aspect and then its spiritual aspect, its intellectual aspect, its humanistic aspect. Uh, and both are deserving of study and have received extensive study, uh, especially in the 20th, 21st century. So just, uh, I want to talk mainly about the humanistic uh, elements in these prefatory poems written about Shakespeare, what they tell us about him. Uh, he's notorious for having kept uh, himself to himself. He was a very private person, but nonetheless, uh, there's a lot that we can glean, I think, from Ben Jonson's poem in particular, who knew, who knew him uh, very well. But first, for the material aspects, as Michelle pointed out, 18 plays in the first folio we have no other copies for, including, as she mentioned, Twelfth Night, The Tempest, Macbeth, <coughs> Anthony and Cleopatra, The Winter's Tale, Julius, Julius Caesar. So it's quite a list that we would never have known about were it not for the work of the editors, John Hemming and Henry Condell. Uh, on the handout, you have their uh, prose preface, which... Uh, we'll look at if, uh, if, if we have some time in a little bit. Hemings and Condell were fellow actors. Uh, they were the only members of Shakespeare's acting troupe uh, that survived until the publication of the first folio in 1623. Uh, his acting troupe was formed in 1594 as the Lord Chamberlain's men later became uh, the King's men. So Hemings and Condell uh, are a link uh, to the very beginning of Shakespeare's dramatic career. In Shakespeare's will, he only uh, mentioned three of the actors in his troupe uh, for bequests, and Hemings, Heming and Condell were two of them, uh, and he gave a mourning ring, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, a ring uh, as a commemoration of, uh, of him, and so they received that from him. Uh, amongst the editorial work which Hemings and Condell had to undertake were to include and exclude plays. We talked about the ones they included. There were some, though, that bore Shakespeare's name, uh, which were inferior plays, such as uh, A Yorkshire Tragedy and The London Prodigal, which would almost surely have been included in the first folio uh, were it not for their work, because there would have been no particular reason to exclude them, but they did. Uh, they had to commission scribes to prepare copies for the printer. Uh, they also commissioned Martin Rueshoot uh, to engrave a portrait for the title page, and that's another one of the uh, handouts that you, that you have here. He was a young Dutch engraver, I think 22 years old at the time that he prepared this engraving, and nobody really likes it uh, anymore, you know. I mean, it looks pretty fuddy-duddy and bourgeois, and you know, uh, somebody who'd run a grocery store or something rather than the greatest writer who ever lived. Uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's clear that uh, he put the head, uh, stuck it upon a kind of stock uh, torso there because the head doesn't really go with the torso. But Ben Johnson has a poem in, in another one of the handouts, and uh, uh, he compliments uh, the likeness uh, to the man himself. Drews, who presumably uh, took instructions from Ben Johnson and other people who, Hemming and Condell, who knew Shakespeare in order to get some idea of what he looked like uh, because he would never have seen him. Uh, so we'll look at Johnson's uh, poem about this, uh, this engraving here too in, in just a bit. Um, Hemming and Condell also determined the order of the plays, their generic categories, the first folios, uh, Texts were divided into uh, comedies, histories, and tragedies, 36 plays in total. Even though 18 of the plays had been published before, uh, they, had to, uh, they took their work seriously. They could have just taken the first copies of those printed plays which came to hand and presented them to the, to the uh, printers to be reproduced. But a lot of those copies were defective. That's been a, 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 a subject of a great deal of the scholarly investigation over the over the past decades in the 20th century. So they made a real effort to find which were the most authoritative 
of those early printed copies which were called quartos, Q-U-A-R-T-O-S. They, they, they took their job seriously. As many of you know, I'm sure there was the, the first published edition of Hamlet had only about half the play. Uh, and they, it was clearly a truncated version. Uh, the to be or not to be speech, you know, is kind of to be or not to be, well, what a question that is. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not uh, the Shakespeare that we know. Uh, the second quarto was a better copy, but Hemming and Condell appeared to have done some real bibliographic work in comparing the quartos. And of course, they really knew Shakespeare, and they would have had some insight truly into his intentions. Uh, and perhaps had they started their work soon enough, they could have asked him. Uh, so the first folio texts uh, have always uh, uh, assumed a great authority, even though modern bibliographies will quarrel with, bibliogra bibliographers will quarrel with certain of their selections. Sir Stanley uh, Wells, who was the head of the Shakespeare Institute in Birmingham for many years, summarizes some of the consequences of there having never been a Shakespeare first folio. Shakespeare would have not have been the preeminent dramatist that he is now. The English language would be far less rich. Countless works of art of many kinds inspired by these plays would not have come into existence. The careers of most great actors and directors would have been different. Innumerable scholarly and critical books and articles on Shakespeare would have been shorter and many would never have come into being. I wonder if the Sir Stanley had his tongue in cheek when he wrote that last bit, you know, about there wouldn't be nearly the number of scholarly books uh, uh, whether, were there no first folio. But we here in the profession are very glad uh, that, uh, uh, that there were. Also, I would add, our understanding of human nature would have been greatly impoverished, and it is this which is our main interest today. So, I do want to get to that subject. First, though, let's take a quick look at the preface by Hemming and Condell, uh, which is this uh, text which is addressed to the great variety of, of readers. Uh, right there, I've always been attracted to this preface. I don't know that it gets all the attention that it deserves. I mean, these are people who really knew Shakespeare well, who worked with him, you know, some of his the longest standing colleagues. Uh, and their first line is, from the most able to him that can but spell. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a democratic work, in other words. Uh, the great variety of readers, nobody's excluded. There you are numbered. We had rather you were weighed. When they say weighed, they mean, well, uh, that you were serious about your undertaking here. Especially when the fate of all books depends upon your capacities and not of your heads alone, but of your purses. Well, it is now public and you will stand for your, your privileges, we know, to read and censure. Do so, but buy it first. That doth best command a book, the stationer says. Then how odd soever your brains be. Uh, Renaissance dramatists, no different from dramatists or writers of any period, you know, they, they didn't particularly care for their critics, um, uh, their censors. And in those days, the audience could sit on the stage. Uh, and so if they didn't like the way a particular production was going, they had no difficulty in making their views known to the actors, among whom may well have been the dramatist, uh, as Shakespeare and Johnson appeared in their own and each other's plays. So uh, the audience was, uh, they were not shy, they were not uh, wallflowers. So, how odd so ever your brains be or your wisdoms, make your license the same and spare not. Judge your six penny worth, your shillings worth, your five shillings worth at a time or higher, so you rise to the just rates and welcome. But whatever you do, buy. <laughs> uh, so some things never change. Uh, just to highlight a couple other things here that they say in line 15, uh, they, they uh, tell their readers that they had been previously abused by the frauds and stealths of injurious impostors. That is, there had been published uh, copies of Shakespeare's works, which were not Shakespeare's work. Uh, and so they undertook this arduous task uh, of finding out what he really did say, which of course, as I say, they had the advantage being perhaps had they started this, nobody knows when they started this project of compiling the manuscripts, the first folio, uh, but they had the uh, inestimable advantage of, of going to Shakespeare himself and asking. Uh, line 20, what he thought he uttered with easiness that we have scarce received from him a blot in his papers. 
uh, indicating they had his original manuscripts. You know, there are no original manuscripts of any of, of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, uh, the scholars think that maybe three pages of a, of a play that's, that's seldom read, uh, named Sir Thomas More, uh, are in his handwriting. Uh, but, but, but that's it. So they had his papers, and they're saying that he, Shakespeare never had to cross out. Uh, now, you would think that's surely hyperbole. Uh, you know, I mean, we do have manuscripts from the uh, from the 17th century, and, and you know, they look much like our own manuscripts might uh, might look. There, there, there's a lot of changes which are made. Ben Johnson said himself said this can't be true. Uh, in one of his notebooks, he said uh, the players used to say about Shakespeare he never blotted a line. Uh, ben Johnson said would he had blotted a thousand, which the players thought was my malice. Well, yeah, they they might huh? think it uh, think it was his malice. But it introduces, I think, a kind of note of, uh, of, of, of realism. Nonetheless, uh, it seems clear that Shakespeare was a very fluid writer. And then at the, at the end here, uh, they're not talking so much about buying. Now they're talking, line 24, about reading. Read him, therefore, and again and again, what we say to our students. Read the text again and again. If then you do not like him, surely you are in some manifest danger not to understand him. And so we leave you to other of his friends, whom if you need can be your guides. He's talking, they're talking about the poems which are to come here in, in the preface, especially Ben Johnson's. If you need them not, you can lead yourselves and others, and such readers we wish him. So Hemming and Condell, even though it's terribly important to them that the, that the book be bought, and as Michelle indicated, some 750 copies, we think, uh, were sold. A lot survive, really. Um, it, a lot of speculation, I think, about how much, how much it actually cost. Wouldn't help to know all that well because, you know, the price, the, the values of money have changed so much. But uh, the estimates I've seen by somebody who's recently investigated that, what, what he says is that of the few people we know that bought the first folio, they were fairly well off. You know, they were, they, were, they were upper middle class, so maybe not too many of the groundlings. Uh, uh, you know, those who paid a penny to get in and stand uh, near the stage were reading the first folio, but Hemming and Condell made them uh, quite welcome to have done so. Okay, uh, right below that uh, is Ben Jonson's first poem of the two that he wrote. Uh, this is called To the Reader. Uh, ben Jonson provided the model for the Shakespeare first folio. He himself was the first English author to publish his own work. Uh, that was an astonishing fact I, when I remember encountering that whenever it was for the first time, I suppose sometime in, in graduate school, that no English author had ever published his own work. I mean, the printing press had been around you know, since the uh, 15th century, and yet until 1616, no English author had published his own work, and Ben Jonson did so. And he got a lot of flack for it. Uh, it was a kind of uh, uh, the uh, literati, uh, the elite, I suppose, of the day said that a playwright had no business publishing plays in folio editions. Uh, that was just meant for uh, works of theology or philosophy, maybe history, antiquarians uh, published in folio. But Johnson, uh, a man of very independent thought, uh, went ahead and did so anyway. Uh, and so it is thought, although we have no testimony uh, to this effect, that Johnson was deeply involved then in the putting together of Shakespeare's first folio. They were friends, they were rivals, they'd been in each other's plays. Um, it certainly would make sense that he was actively involved. So, um, oh, I wanted to read what one wag of the time said about Johnson's publishing, uh, publishing his own folio. Pray tell me, Ben, where doth the mystery lurk? What others call a play, you call a work. Uh, well, that was, that was a put down, but uh, Johnson was, had a pretty thick skin uh, and, and didn't bother him a great deal. Okay, so look at, uh, if, if you would, please, uh, Johnson's poem to the reader here. It's a very, very short poem, and he's talking about the Drew's Hoot uh, portrait. This figure that thou here seest put, it was for gentle Shakespeare cut, wherein the graver had a strife with nature to outdo the life. 
Oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he hath hit his face, the print would then surpass all that was ever written in brass. But since he cannot, reader, look not on his picture, but his book. And this is kind of the transition between the first folio as a material product, a, a physical product, a, a physical book, and then the contents which it contains, which after all is ultimately the reason that it's such a famous book. Uh, it contains the plays of Shakespeare. And so Johnson, while not denying what Heming and Condell would say, buy the book. Uh, in fact, he may have also contributed to that preface that, uh, that they wrote. Nonetheless, he says, let's be clear about where the importance of this book lies, and that's in what it says. Johnson himself, when he published his own folio, had a little poem, the first poem in that uh, a great folio of his uh, was addressed to the reader and it was just two lines uh, and he said reader that takest my book in hand take care to read it well that is to understand because the understanding is the intellectual part of our nature and that's where the contents of the physical book should end up being so okay we, look, we turn now to the uh, longer poem uh, which is on the back of the, uh, of the first page. To the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he has left us. Um, this is a uh, poem of praise. Uh, that's its genre. Uh, the, the Greeks called it an epideptic uh, poem. Um, Johnson was known for his poems of praise. I think... To praise someone had a very specific meaning uh, for the 17th century going back in really into ancient times. Uh, the writers were very careful to distinguish praise from flattery. Uh, flattery flattens, praise exalts. And it is Johnson's concern in this poem, I wouldn't say so much to exalt Shakespeare because that would be to say that it would be his work to do that but rather to show Shakespeare's exalted status, uh, which by virtue of his accomplishment in these plays, he had achieved. And then the purpose of the object of praise is to raise the reader uh, of the poem to that status, to lift him up, as it were. Uh, as flattery again can flatten and reduce to a common denominator, praise, the idea was, can lift us up to that region where the author himself resides. It can make us like him if we understand him, if we have taken him, uh, if we have taken him at his value, if we have paid attention to uh, what he says. So Johnson says, understand the author. Understand, of course, means simply to stand, you know, to, to stand under. Uh, it's not that we will be apothe uh, apotheosized with Shakespeare as he was. At the very end of the poem, Johnson sees Shakespeare as residing in a star uh, in, in the sky, you know, kind of like uh, uh, Julius Caesar, the old Roman, Roman emperors. Uh, I don't know that he's saying we're going to be, you know, divinized like he sees Shakespeare as having been divinized, but we're going to be lifted up uh, into his, uh, into the place where he is. So... Memory, three words in that title I, I, I want to just very quickly uh, touch on. To the memory of my beloved. The mem to, to, to memorialize uh, a great person is not just to remember the facts about their life, uh, their particular accomplishments. It, it's not to review their CV. Uh, it's not to talk about the past as the past, but it's to bring the past into the present. Uh, it's to make clear what Shakespeare's relevance is for us, those readers in 1623. And Johnson, I think, would have had no trouble saying, or the readers in 2016. Uh, because it is an astonishing thing uh, that Shakespeare seems to be more relevant, more popular, uh, more widely, a greater interest in him now than ever before. That wouldn't have, that wouldn't have surprised Johnson. We remember him in order to incorporate him, in order to be like him, in order to, uh, to have him help to elevate us above ourselves, to be better than we uh, otherwise have been, would have been or ordinarily would have been. So 
this is not just the past is past, that memory. Memory brings the past into the present. Beloved, a uh, very personal word, huh? Uh, Johnson is not afraid to be personal, uh, to be intimate. I think it's a word which basically still carries its, its same wallop. You know, to call somebody a beloved is, is, is to say something very particular. It's to designate them perhaps as the first loved or the most loved. Uh, it's a special category of, of love even. The author, that's the third word I, I wanted to mention, the author. Now, some, um, some writers think that this emphasis on the author uh, in the early 17th century is a sign of egocentricity. Um, and of course, I mean, you can never rule that out, huh? Uh, I mean, I'm sure Johnson and Shakespeare had kind of, well, not, I don't know about Shakespeare, but Johnson certainly had the same delight, you know, that, uh, of seeing his name in print as, as anybody else would have. But I don't think that was the fundamental motivation, you know. Uh, I, I suppose really most writers, you, I mean, as I say, you can never eliminate the egocentric element, but still you want what you're saying to be read. You want it to be heard, you want it to be understood, you want it to be discussed. Um, you, you want it to have some kind of uh, impact uh, to make a difference. This, this word author, so while, while still having the modern idea, I am an author, you know, are you an author? Yes, I am an author. Uh, it also, and uh, Stephen's been working on this in his uh, dissertation, uh, the old Middle English word, octor, octorite, author as connected to authority. Uh, the Middle English writers always talked about their octor, uh, their source, their authority. Uh, the old book, and so often it was an old book, although it's hard to find those old books, but they said they existed, which granted uh, status to what they had to say. Uh, they did not believe so much in originality in the way, say, that the Romantics came to believe in originality, something that had never been said before. Uh, in fact, that might disqualify it uh, from one's understanding. Uh, the idea that it had been said before gave it an authority. And so Shakespeare is one not so much who is saying things that have never been said, but he is re-articulating those things indeed in a unique way, in a special way, in a memorable way. Uh, and his words have certainly been remembered, which if remembered can influence our lives. Uh, and not only by being remembered, but by being spoken. And that's the other element in this, uh, in this poem. Shakespeare writes living lines, uh, says Johnson. And they're living in part because people can, can say them. You know, they can use their breath to utter them. They can be heard. In the beginning was the word. Uh, the great poet is re-articulating that beginning for his own time, and as it happens with the great author, uh, for times to come. So he's an author. Uh, as you know, Shakespeare is famous for never having made up one of his own plots. Huh? Uh, I mean, there are... Uh, there are plays like, I think, A Midsummer Night's Dream that, you know, scholars will say, well, we can't find this source, but we know there is one because he always had one, uh, you know, and maybe he had four or five or six of them. I mean, he just seemed to love to pillage. Uh, well, of course, there's that element, always nice to follow, you know, along what someone else has said, but also it gave the stamp of authenticity to one's work, you know. Uh, I mean, after all, if one says something at this late date that's never been said before, that, that would be extraordinary, huh? you know? Um, so, I've never, well, okay. So, uh, quickly, because I want to leave plenty of time for, uh, uh, for your, your own comments uh, on, on these things. The, uh, the, the poem's a long poem, and just to, uh, to touch on a few highlights here, uh, I'm not going to look at those. Uh, the introduction is interesting, but he doesn't really get to his subject until line 17 uh, when he addresses, he says, I therefore will begin. It's a great thing about Johnson, you know, I mean, it doesn't leave you in any doubt. Where, where, how does this poem begin? Well, right here. Uh, I therefore will begin. Soul of the age. Uh, and he's not afraid to begin with an exclamation, you know, exclamatory statement. Soul of the age. The applause, the light, the wonder of our stage, my Shakespeare rise. Um, as, I, as I've been suggesting, the, the real purpose of this poem is to bring Shakespeare back to life. It's to make him live again. It's to make him present to the readers of the first folio. He, Johnson 
would propose, and it's kind of audacious, but poets do this all the time, uh, he would propose to give us the living presence of the man uh, that we will then come to encounter in ever more direct ways as we read the plays. So, my Shakespeare rise could hardly be more specific in that sense. And again, that term of endearment, the personal quality is not, not left. As the Irish say, the personal touch. My Shakespeare, my Shakespeare, intimacy, rise. I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer, or bid Beaumont lie a little further to make thee a room. Thou art a monument without a tomb, and art alive still while thy book doth live, and we have wits to read and praise to give. And so often there, Johnson is summarizing what I've been trying to say in about, in about three lines. A monument without a tomb. He's not dead. You know, uh, uh, there are monuments to Shakespeare. There was one erected in Stratford shortly after his death, but it was not at his tomb. Uh, there would be no particular point in going to his tomb. Thou art alive, how so? While thy book doth live. And we have wits to read and praise to give. If we can understand him, as Heming and Condell said, then we will praise him. And if we don't praise him, it's because we're in danger of not understanding him. Uh, oh, then he, it's interesting this poem, uh, he compares Shakespeare to his contemporaries. He compares him to the greatest figures in Greece and Rome. Uh, he says he's better than all of them. Um, line 29, thou didst our lily outshine or sporting kid, kid or Marlowe's mighty line, Aeschylus, Euripides, and, and Sophocles. Before that, though, line 31, he says, and though thou hadst small Latin and less Greek. Now, that's one line for those who want to see that Johnson is envious and malicious in this poem. And John Dryden, bless his heart, uh, comment on this, uh, on this poem. I must have excised it because it just really makes you mad <laughs> when, you, uh, when you read what Dryden had to say. He was a pretty good poet in the later part of the, uh, the 17th century, but he calls Johnson's poem uh, invidious, uh, malicious, and scant. You know, I thought he'd throw in scant there. Just, it's like he, he, he chose the three adjectives that you would never in your life fix to this, uh, this poem and, and, and did so, you know. Uh, so it's malicious, invidious, and scant. In the very beginning of the poem, uh, Johnson says that he did not intend. He says, you know, look at, look at those first four words of the poem. To draw no envy, Shakespeare, on thy name. Am I thus ample to thy book and fame? That is, he says, I'm going to say a lot about you, but it's not so people will envy you and then throw stones at you. Uh, and then Dryden says, this is a poem which is malicious in its envy and scant. He doesn't find much. So what can you do? I mean, you know. Dryden was lucky Johnson it was dead. You know, I mean, it had been in his tomb a long time, too. Uh, but anyway, that, this is the one line that would appear to uh, give some validation uh, to that kind of critique. Uh, I, I, would, I, I would argue not so. Uh, one, uh, one critic called it a paradox that though Shakespeare was not a learned classicist, nonetheless, look what he did. You don't have to be a learned classicist. Also, to have small Latin and less Greek by Ben Jonson standard, who was the greatest classicist of his time, or by really any uh, person who had been to, uh, to, to uh, 16th, 17th century Renaissance public schools, I mean, that was to have a lot. You know, that was to have a lot uh, of Greek and even more Latin, uh, because the whole education, the Stratford Public Schools, for example, began with Latin in the most elementary uh, form. Uh, they began with Aesop's fables in, in Latin. So you have to, I think you have to make some kind of allowance there. It's a paradox, uh, one might say, but I don't know that he meant it to be, uh, he, he meant it to be malicious. He compares him with the, uh, the Greek uh, dramatist, line 41. He says, triumph my Britain, he's a nationalist, uh, Shakespeare, uh, you, you, 16th, 17th century, the, the rise of nationalism. Johnson is claiming Shakespeare to be the nation's poet. That's a new idea. Don't think Johnson ever claimed that for himself. 
Uh, you remember back in the year 2000 when the, uh, the, the English voted on who was the greatest person of the millennium? They chose Shakespeare, for God's sake. You know? <laughs> uh, so uh, again, this is a kind of prophetic poem. Um, Johnson knew what he was talking about. Then the famous line, uh, line 43, he was not of an age but for all time. That has to do with that living quality, that we, uh, again prophetic, the living quality. Thou art not dead, thou art alive. When like Apollo, now mythological comparisons, he's made comparisons to the contemporaries, uh, made comparisons to the uh, historical dramatists of Greek, Greece and Rome. Now he moves into mythology. Uh, continuing to elevate Shakespeare's status and take us with him, as he would hope. When, like Apollo, he came forth to warm our ears, or like a Mercury to charm. Apollo was the, uh, the Greek god of uh, poetry, also the god of the sun. Thus warmed our, warmed our ears. Mercury, the god of eloquence, uh, so, uh, uh, especially invoked by orators, so both the poet and the orator. Nature herself was proud of his designs and joyed to wear the dressing of his lines. Line 55, yet must I not give nature all thy, thy art, my gentle Shakespeare, must enjoy a part. Fit line 59, he who cast to write a living line must sweat. Uh, and his lines are living, huh? I mean, how often they're quoted. Uh, quoted, uh, you know, people may not even know uh, who they're quoting. Um, I'm old enough to remember, uh, I'm old enough to remember a lot more than this, but I'm old enough to remember the Watergate, <laughs> the Watergate hearings when, uh, back in the 70s, when uh, the North Carolina Senator Sam Irvin, uh, you know, he'd quote the Bible, he'd quote Shakespeare, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to tune in for, the, for those events, but uh, it, was, it was fun just to hear him quote Shakespeare. Uh, living lines. Um, this business about nature and art, uh, and I'm going to stop here in just a couple minutes. Um, you know, sometimes when in the presence of greatness, one says, well, yeah, but, you know, he was born that way. Uh, he, he had the gods on his side. He had the genes on his side. You know, Michael Jordan, you, don't, you, you can't teach somebody to jump that high. Uh, a guy who's seven foot tall in basketball, you can't coach height. Uh, you know, as some wag said, no fooling. <laughs> you can't coach height. Yeah, one is endowed with special abilities. But, and, and the implication being, yeah, well, if I had been, you know, given his advantages, I could have done the same thing. Johnson wants to make it clear here. Uh, yes, nature had been kind to Shakespeare, but that's not all. He worked at it. He writes his lines with sweat. A living line must sweat, such as thine are. Uh, thy art, my gentle Shakespeare, must enjoy a part. There's again that direct uh, apostrophizing of Shakespeare, the direct address to him, my Shakespeare, as though he's right there, as though he's alive. We've seen his portrait. Now we see Johnson's recreation of him through the living voice. And soon we'll, we'll uh, hear Shakespeare's own voice. Uh, when we start to read the plays. A good poet's, line 64, a good poet's made as well as born. Uh, and that's a great compliment. Sure, he was born with advantages, but he also worked at it. 38 plays, uh, we think now, 36, the first fellow, probably a couple more, 38 plays in 20 years. Uh, he was an actor, he was a businessman, he invested his money wisely, he loaned money, he was very active. Uh, he wasn't a layabout. Uh, he wasn't just born that way. A good poet's made as well as born. There's, a, uh, there's an old proverb that says a good poet is born. You have to be born to be a good poet. Uh, Johnson's inverting that a little bit to, in compliment to Shakespeare. Okay. Look how thy father's face lives in his issue. Again, lives. We see the man in his lines, in his plays. Line 69, the, the pun, um, talking about Shakespeare's lines, and each of which he seems to shake a lance. As brandished at the eyes of ignorance, sweet swan of Avon, that's line 71, that's the last direct address, sweet swan of Avon, uh, he calls him. Uh, and the, uh, the swan was a figure that had been associated with classical poets, with Virgil, with Homer, uh, also with Apollo, 
leaves the earth, takes off into the heavens, you know, kind of an image of poetry. I, I remember the first time I went to, uh, to Stratford-on-Avon, uh, a thrill to see the swans there, you know, on, on the River Avon as soon as you, as soon as you come into the into town. Sweet, and it's sweet. Think about that adjective. Now, this is a, this is a poem of invidiousness and maliciousness uh, and envy, and I don't think so. Huh? Well, not to, not, not, not to drum that, uh, drum on that too much. Okay, so I uh, would uh, be delighted for other, it, just your comments, questions if you have them, but comments um, on uh, this. This, I think this is the, uh, this is the, the best of the prefatory material. So um, the survival rate of the folio was like 30%. The what? The survival rate of the original yeah. of the first run. Yeah. Even though that was, it was an expensive book yeah. and went into libraries, I mean private libraries, that still seems like an extraordinary survival yeah, rate for yeah, really 400 yeah. years. Do, well, we, can we, do we know the survival rate for Ben Johnson's first folios? Don't know. Don't know if anybody studied that or not. I know I had actually a, a student one time brought in the second folio of Ben Johnson. <laughs> I was terribly impressed by that. He was a book collector, as it turned out. Uh, but that was the second folio, never as valuable as, as the first. But, you know, if it was bought by pretty well-to-do people, you know, who would have conserved it in their library. I mean, folios were... You know, it's like coffee table books. Folios have often been uh, compared to. And if, if you get a coffee table book, even if you never read it or n never look at it, you tend not to throw it out uh, because it's valuable. You know, it, it has, it has cost, uh, cost something. So um, I, I, I agree with you. I think that is a very, uh, a very high rate. Professor Rasmussen from uh, the University of Nevada, Reno, is going to be here in, uh, what, about a week from uh, Sunday? And uh, he has pursued these first folio copies that still uh, are in existence around the world. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have some interesting tales to tell, you know, about wh where they are and how they got there. Uh, because it, I mean, it, it does, the, the, the physical object, the book, uh, because of whose it is, uh, does have a, you know, there's a lot of interest, a lot of interest to it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not so sure. Uh, you know, they say they did that with the Bible in the Middle Ages uh, because the Bible was not widely available. It was written in Latin, so they'd, you know, put a copy in the church and you could go look at it. I'm not sure that, you know, there was, uh, the, 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 there was a library system in anything like our own terms. You know, it was, it was the, uh, the nobility who, who, who patronized these things and then they collected them for their own libraries and, and you know, it was the... The aristocrats' libraries that became the basis for the famous libraries in in Britain. You know the Bodleian. Uh, you know the, the cotton. The cotton library became the basis for the British uh, British Library. So, I'm not sure that there really, you know, there really would have been. Um, I think the idea still was about plays that you went to hear them. Uh, uh, that was, you know, we talk about going to see a play, and it'd be fairly unusual, I suppose, to say I'm going to go hear a play. But, the, but the, the hearing of the play was just as much, if not more, the common lingo, you know, about having experienced the drama. So uh, uh, the idea of having it in print, that was something that slowly became more and more prominent. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's quite true. Yeah. Recording this so that oh, okay. you get your question. Thank you. In that case, thanks very much. I truly appreciate yep, it, good. and I learned a lot from it. Thank you. Oh, My question has to do. It's two questions that have to do with how you highlighted the word author. Yeah. Because I find it fascinating. I don't work with English letters. I work right. with different literature, right. from, with Spanish literature. But author, in regards to someone who's writing a play, I know that in Spain, the authors who were first able to earn a living from writing and not needing a mecenas. They all had those sponsors and patrons anyway, but you could make a living, and that's why other authors were always jealous. Yeah. Does the same go in English literature? Well, you know, there are, um, uh, Hemingway and Condell also wrote um, 
a little prose preface to their, to their patrons, and there, and there were two of them. Uh, so that patron is terribly important. Uh, I don't know that, um, you know, without that, that, that the book would have been profitable. You, you, can, you can detect real insecurity here, you know, <laughs> and understandable on the part of Hemming and Condell. You know, buy the book. Um, and uh, understandably so, but, you know, no, it, certainly in this period, uh, authors were famous for their poverty. Shakespeare was an exception, but he did it not necessarily because of his literary activity, but because he was a good businessman. You know, and he invested in property in, in uh, Stratford, and as they lended, he lent money. Uh, he even sued to be repaid uh, the money. Uh, so, you know, to find, uh, uh, to find an English author that really made a, uh, a good living by means of his work, you know, maybe uh, names come to mind with, uh, with folks. I mean, uh, Samuel Johnson certainly, you know, wasn't the case. Um, perhaps not, not so much. You know, uh, Johnson complained all the time about being impoverished. Spencer was said to have died, died a pauper. Edmund Spencer uh, was said to have died a pauper. You know, uh, it, it's, uh, it's astonishing. They had court connections, too. Johnson was, was given a, a pension in 1616 when his first folio came out uh, by the king, and that's often been taken to be the, the first, uh, he was the first poet laureate. Uh, as a result, and I don't know what, 20 pounds or something like that, and, and, uh, but you know, he'd, he'd have to go sue the treasurer to get that paid. So, um, um, they were more fortunate, Sue, in, uh, in, in Spain, I would say. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I was just wondering, um, you mentioned in the poem where he calls him the sweet swan of Avon. Right. Do you know when he became known as the bard of Avon? The bard? <laughs> uh, well, certainly by the 19th, the 19th century, the early 19th century, the, um, you know, the Romantics loved, loved Shakespeare. They loved older literature. They loved the Middle Ages. And uh, there was this thing called uh, bardolatry. You know, I mean, that, that became frequently referred to and, and uh, writers would say, we've got to watch out about this, you know, we're, we're, we're giving him too much credit. So, the Bard, um, uh, it was established, I'd say, by that time. Who first started referring to him in that way? Actually, Shakespeare's reputation in the 17th century went into something of a decline uh, after, after his death. Uh, Johnson was more popular in the 17th century. Uh, Johnson's play that nobody reads anymore uh, called Catiline uh, was the most performed and read play in the 17th century. It's amazing. And, and apparently its political uh, themes spoke to that period. It was in the 18th century when literary scholarship really began to take off that Shakespeare was discovered and promoted and Samuel Johnson in, in the middle of the 18th century uh, published his first great, uh, great edition, and Pope, uh, uh, Pope greatly admired Shakespeare. I'd say it was sometime in the, eight, in the 18th century. But, you know, like the bard, Aristotle's referred to as the philosopher, uh, Homer is the poet, uh, but you're right, you know, Shakespeare as, uh, uh, as, as the bard. But, I, you know, I like Sweet Swan of Avon better, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the bard. <laughs> Feel like you need to you know, button your collar or something if you're talking to the bard, but... Sweet Swan of Avon, hey. Uh, my question is, so both works are directed towards two different people. One says to the great variety of readers, right, and the right. second says to the reader. Do you think that the different works, or the first folio in general, is um, meant for two different audiences? That Ben Johnson meant it for a certain kind of audience, and uh, mm -hmm. John and Henry yeah. Condell for a different audience? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, they're hoping for a great variety of readers. You know, they, they are certainly interested in the masses, as it were. You know, uh, they, they're, they're hoping for a lot of readers. Johnson's being much more personal, as, as is his want. Uh, to the reader, that is you and me. Uh, the, the modern poet, E.E. Uh, e. Cummings, um, is, is, is good on this. You know, Cummings has a, one of his prefaces. Uh, he says, these poems are not for most people. And, and he writes, most people is one word. 
They are for you and me, uh, he says. And I, I think, you know, writers have that kind of, th th this is a one-on-one -on -one business here. Uh, and they want to establish that communication. So that's a, that's a good point, though, that you make. There is, there is that difference. Uh, uh, the guys who, whose finances are on the line don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, but the guy who's most interested, I mean, Johnson always knew he wasn't going to make a living at, at poetry, but he stayed at it anyway. They're, they're just wanting to have that personal, that personal touch, yeah, uh, to, to, to us. Yeah. Going once, twice. Anybody with any comments on the Shakespeare or the, or the folio or those, those of you who have seen it? Some of you, some of you have seen it. What, what impression did you have just from coming into contact with the, uh, with the book. Yeah. My, com Sorry. My comment is it was remarkably beautifully printed. It's quite legible and, and very modern looking Roman type. Right. So I thought right. I was impressed by that because any many older books look kind of sad actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're old. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Very carefully done. Do we know any of where this first folio came from? Uh, Who? As a security measure, we do not know which uh, copy of we have. Um, yeah. At the conclusion of the tour, um, all of the folios that were going around the United States will be displayed in the Folger Library, and uh, each folio will have a list of all the cities they visited. So we will discover which one we had and learn more about its previous owners probably in November or December. I see. You know, I saw, I saw a list of the prices of the first folio in the, in the uh, 20th century. And actually, had we been alive 100 years ago, we could have gotten one at a fairly reasonable sum. Uh, it just kind of makes you sad, you know, even, uh, even though it's a great time to be alive now. But I mean, you know, $15,000 you could have gotten the first folio in, in 1920 when Folger was uh, acquiring his, uh, his collection. You got to say something for those robber barons, don't you? I mean, uh, uh, Folger, you know, vice president of Standard Oil, working for John D. Rockefeller. But by golly, he uh, he had a fascination with uh, uh, with the first folio and, and acquired all the collected all these all these editions. Yeah. Any final questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Many thanks for coming. And I encourage you to go see the folio. Please have patience if you need to queue up. We are asking you to register, leave your name, and um, just so we know how many people can go see the folio. But we're limited to about 40 people at one time. So if you want to queue up and go see the folio, it's just in special collections across the way. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>